Should we start? Okay. So just to warn you, I'm going to talk in English. So if you <laughs> don't want to hear me in English, you have to run out now. Um, it's a big honor to uh, present today. And uh, I really want to thank Jean-Jacques for uh, inviting me and, and you for your uh, patience, hopefully, and, and sticking around. So I will talk about our recent findings in um, uh, human evolution, and I'll talk about the evolution and development of the human brain. And uh, I want to show you some uh, stuff that we published recently and research that we haven't published yet. But uh, because I know it's a diverse audience here, I want to uh, frame it in a, in a bigger picture so you know uh, why we think this is relevant for uh, the study of human evolution. And uh, what I want to show you is uh, one aspect of what we think makes us modern humans unique. And uh, the approach I'm going to take is comparing modern humans living today to our uh, living closest relatives, uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas. And in particular, I'm going to show you research about um, pygmy chimpanzees, the bonobos. And of course, uh, we can learn a lot about modern humans by looking at our closest fossil relatives, in this particular case, the oscillopids and uh, the Neanderthals. And if we compare modern humans to uh, our closest living and, and fossil relatives, then there are two things that um, stick out. So we, we have a very large and very complex brain, but we are also um, have evolved a very unusual way of walking around. We have uh, evolved a bipedal locomotion, and, uh, and that is a characteristic of the hominin lineage of something that uh, goes back millions of years. And it's important that these two characteristics did not evolve at the same time. If we look at a very um, uh, schematic picture of, uh, of brain size evolution, then you can see that the, the earliest hominins, the oscillopids, and even the earliest um, representative of the, of the modern, of, of the human uh, lineage, in this case I, I put up Homo habilis, they had uh, uh, very small brain sizes that are comparable to brain sizes that um, modern apes have. And then uh, around one million years ago, there seems to be almost what in this schematic looks like an explosion. And, uh, and Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis, they have the largest brains in the hominin lineage. And it's a bit misleading here it, uh, in, in this graph because uh, most of it, and, and Jean-Jacques mentioned this just before, most of it um, uh, of this early increase has to do with an increase of body size. But in the later stages of human evolution, especially when we talk about modern humans and Neanderthals, we really have an increase in brain size uh, that is independent of body size, and that, is, um, that happens in, in both lineages. So it's important um, for the, I would say, second part of my talk today to understand that uh, in both the Neanderthal lineage and in the modern human lineage, we have an independent uh, evolution of brain size. So um, that will become important later. But what's important now is for the big picture to understand is that the bipedal locomotion, the unusual way of walking around, evolved much, much earlier than this brain size increase. So we have evidence of upright walking um, apes from the chat that are maybe as old as six million years ago. There's some, I would say, debate and discussion whether these hominins are directly related to us. But um, there's absolutely no doubt that at 3.6 million years ago, uh, there are upright walking hominins that are on our, basically, direct lineage, the oscillopids. And we know this because uh, we have uh, footprints of, uh, in this case, Lucy and her partner, if you want, um, that were fossilized in, in an ash layer that you can directly date and that we know that at 3.6 million years ago, these hominins walked upright. And that, of course, is much, much earlier than uh, this brain size increase that we find in 
the hominin lineage. And why is this so important, this, I would say, four million year time gap, is because if you evolve upright walking, if you evolve bipedal locomotion, then you have to change your body. And this is uh, a homo sapiens compared to a gorilla. And you can see that with upright walking, a lot of uh, changes, anatomical changes happen to the spine and to the way that the head is positioned on the spine. So that's how we think we know that uh, Sahelanthropus, this fossil from Chad, um, was an upright walking hominin because basically the, the foramen magnum, the hole that connects um, the skull to the, to the spine, has moved uh, anteriorly. And then you have a, a very different attachment of the muscles on your, uh, uh, on your thigh, and you have a change in the hip. So to be an efficient, upright walking hominin, you have to have a narrow hip compared um, to any ape. And if you have a narrow hip, then what happens is that the size of the birth canal gets smaller, which is, of course, a bit inconvenient. Um, if you later then, uh, as a species, uh, decide to uh, uh, to put more emphasis on, uh, on the baby's brain size and head size. And here you can see a schematic of uh, the birth canal of a chimpanzee mother and uh, a chimpanzee neonate passing through the birth canal. And you can see here why it's not a big deal uh, for a chimpanzee mother to give birth. And when I say a big deal, of course, I'm exaggerating, but uh, it's, it's very uncommon for even in the zoo that the keepers notice when a chimpanzee mother gives birth. There's only one filmed um, example of, you know, of all of zoos of the world. Uh, there's one film uh, of a chimpanzee mother giving birth, even though they are you know, under con constant supervision. And it's because uh, to them it's not as painful and, and dangerous as it is for a human mother. And the reason is that uh, human mothers have to give birth through a, a tighter birth canal to a baby with a head that is already as large as um, the one of an adult chimpanzee, right? So we get born with brains that are as big as, as those of an adult chimpanzees, and after birth, they grow even more. And here you can see uh, you know, how tricky the situation is. You, you know, the baby has to rotate twice to fit through the bo um, bony birth canal, and that is an incredibly risky strategy, and when I say risky, I mean evolutionarily risky, because um, that puts the mother and the child at an incredible uh, risk of dying, and in, in developing countries, even today, that's one of the biggest um, healthcare problems, is uh, death for the mother and the child in, 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 well, during childbirth. And of course, I mean, that something like this get selected for, that's a risky strategy. And what's the, um, the solution that we have found as a species or as a lineage for the problem that, okay, you need to have narrow hips to be able to walk, and we want to have uh, babies and adults with large brains. So the, the, the solution for the um, problem that we want women who are able to walk is that we've um, changed the way our brain grows. So this is a drawing, a classic anatomical drawing of uh, the brain shape changes and the brain size changes before birth. And you can see that only just before uh, birth, uh, the, the brain starts to look like a modern human brain. And if, you, if, if we look at the growth curves, then we see, um, and the, the gray area here is what happens before birth, and uh, everything after what happens after birth is we can see that both modern humans and chimpanzee, chimpanzees grow their brains um, after birth, but modern humans do so much, much um, longer and at almost fetal growth rates for almost a year after birth. And um, there's some debate about the exact numbers, but uh, approximately around six years 
a modern human brain is fully grown. It still matures and, and develops internally, but uh, like its size doesn't change as much, and that number is much lower in chimpanzees. And of course, that means that um, basically the, the age of or the length of childhood and uh, extreme brain plasticity is longer in humans, which might explain some of the um, you know, differences in cognitive abilities that separate modern humans from our closest um, living relatives. So um, there are big differences between modern humans and chimpanzees, but that's not a big surprise. So let's look at uh, you know, the other large-brained human species. So uh, let's look at Neanderthals. And let's try to uh, learn something about us from Neanderthals. So many of you know that uh, Neanderthals are the only real Europeans. Um, we've just heard uh, in, in John Jacques' presentation before that everyone else here in the room originates from Africa because modern humans are uh, an African species. And what's interesting is that um, Neanderthals thrived in, under really harsh conditions in the European ice ages, but um, they seemingly disappeared fairly quickly after modern humans set foot in Europe. And it's not clear what happened and why that happened. Um, so the Neanderthals seem to retreat to the south part of Europe and uh, eventually disappear. They don't disappear completely from our genomes, but because you know, those of us with uh, European ancestry um, still carry a little bit of Neanderthal DNA in us, but uh, like morphologically they disappear from the fossil record. And um, it's interesting uh, that this happened because uh, Neanderthals were really well adapted to pretty harsh conditions of the Ice Age. We, we know that both modern humans and Neanderthals were excellent hunters and um, they, uh, they both went you know, after a wide area of, of large game and, and, and they were really skilled at this. But there seem to be some differences in the way that modern humans and Neanderthals interact with their environment. For example, Neanderthals did not uh, eat a lot of fish. Um, some would say ate no fish at all, and that's true for you know, any type of marine uh, resource. So even when they were living next to a lake or next to a river or next to the sea, they did not exploit these resources in the water as much as modern humans did. Whereas we know from modern humans, um, even early modern humans, is that they exploited you know, large game, but also small animals and birds and fish and, uh, and, and seafood. So they, they were much more opportunistic in the way they, um, they treated their diet. And of course, modern humans uh, later on, after the Neanderthals disappeared, um, really developed these uh, incredible artistic expressions that uh, I think probably the most beautiful ones you will find here in France. So this is uh, uh, a reproduction of Lascaux cave, but there are even older ones in the Grotcher Way. And for, of course, you have these beautiful um, uh, Venus figurines in many parts of Europe. For me as an Austrian, you know, the Venus of Willendorf uh, seems to be the most important one, but of course, uh, there are also beautiful ones in France. And many people have argued that um, these differences in, in the behavior that we see here might be related to potentially differences in cognition. And um, that would be interesting because modern humans and Neanderthals both had very similar brain sizes. So that their brain size ranges overlap. And what's uh, I think particularly striking is that uh, modern humans uh, not only have uh, you know, smaller faces than Neanderthals, but despite their similar size, they have a really unusual brain case shape. And, and Jean-Jacques mentioned this before, is that what characterizes all modern humans, everyone here in the room and everyone outside, is that we have uh, very round uh, brain cases. And that, of course, is driven by the underlying brain. So as the brain grows and develops, uh, prenatally and, and directly after birth, the brain basically 
uh, pushes the brain case outward. And so uh, we have rounder brains than Neanderthals did and than any other human species did. So we have an unusual um, uh, brain case shape and brain shape. And what's unusual in modern humans compared to Neanderthals especially is this bulging parietal region and an expanded cerebellum. And what's interesting is, is that we're not born that way. So here in the, the semi-transparent um, skull here is, a, is an adult, a modern human adult. And this is um, the endocast of a neonate. So um, a modern human baby a few days after birth. And what's interesting is that this is very elongated and not round at all. And if we scale it to the size of a Neanderthal, you can see that modern humans, when they're babies, and Neanderthals look very much alike. So we tried um, to apply some of the methods that Jean-Jacques talked about uh, in, in the uh, first part today, um, the, the methods called geometric morphometrics, to look at the statistical shape changes of the endocast. So we make these imprints of the brain case on the computer based on computer tomographic scans, and then we measure hundreds of measurement points, these so-called semi-landmarks on endocasts. And we did this in a cross-sectional sample of chimpanzees and modern humans. And when I say cross-sectional sample, I talk about, um, in this case, chimpanzee babies that grow up to be adults and modern human babies that grow up to be adults. And this, like in the previous presentation, is a principal component analysis of endocranial shape. Um, so we have the, uh, so basically we see the trains, in the large scale trains in the data set, and these are not growth curves in the sense that um, you can see here that something is going fast, but these are shape changes. What um, is interesting is that as soon as the deciduous dentition is erupted, so this, that would be the age group two in modern humans, to age group six, these are the adults, and here's the same in chimpanzees growing up to be adults. We have a lot of uh, similarities, and we call this a shared phase. So basically you could switch the ontogenetic trajectory of a chimpanzee and a modern human, and they would look very similar. But between birth and the eruption of the deciduous dentition, so we're talking about the shape changes in the first year of life, um, generally speaking, we have a, a shape change that does not occur in chimpanzees. And we call this the globularization phase because in this, uh, during this time period, the elongated brain case of a modern human baby becomes um, more globular and changes to the characteristic shape that everyone here in this audience has. And it does it by expanding um, the cerebellum and bulging the parietal area. So, because these are the changes or the shape differences that also separate modern human adults from Neanderthal adults, we then try to ask the question, okay, do Neanderthals also have a globularization phase or not? And to this end, we um, reconstructed Neanderthal babies. And this is a, a 3D animation of a virtual reconstruction based on computer tomographic scans of a Neanderthal baby. So we uh, CT scanned the individual parts that are really extremely fragile. And then I spent um, three months of my life with migraine um, clicking on, on the computer screen to reassemble, um, in this case, two Neanderthal babies. One from, one from France, from uh, Le Moustier, and this one is um, from uh, Mesmaiskaya in Russia. And on the computer, the nice thing is that you can try many, many times. You can mirror image one side to the other. And uh, so we created multiple reconstructions of Neanderthal babies. And what we found is that, um, indeed, even as babies, you could uh, instantly recognize a Neanderthal baby because it has a much larger face than a modern human baby and a bigger nose and all these things that differentiate a modern human uh, from a Neanderthal as adult, you can already see in a neonate 
but you wouldn't be able to tell, or only with a lot of uh, experience, that um, their endocasts, the, the imprints of their brain cases would be any different. So Neanderthals and modern humans had very similar brain shapes at the time of birth, and also very similar brain volumes. You can see here that the semi-transparent blue one is, a mod is the modern human baby, and um, the, the red one is the Neanderthal baby, and they really almost look exactly the same. And if we analyze this, um, along with Neanderthal adults and several other Neanderthal kids, then we find that indeed, after birth, Neanderthals do not have a globularization phase like modern humans do. They grow according to this shared phase that we, we uh, share with uh, you know, humans and chimpanzees and um, also other hominoids. So gibbons and gorillas and orangutans also have this shared phase of, uh, of postnatal endocranial development. So there seems to be a difference in, uh, in the way that the brain grows and um, that uh, is really interesting. But of course, I told you before that we also know that there's a big shift in, in the way uh, modern, human, modern humans grow compared to uh, chimpanzees. So we wanted to know whether um, chimpanzees at least, because we don't have any Neanderthal uh, 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 individuals that are younger than, uh, than neonates, neonates, but uh, we wanted to know at least for chimpanzees whether they have a globalization phase that happens before birth. Right? So let's look at um, these shape changes again. So that happens after birth in modern humans. So we have this expansion of the cerebellum and this bulging of the parietal area, and that, and here this is a little bit exaggerated, but that makes um, the modern human brain case and brain more globular than anyone else. And what's interesting in this movie is that um, we've color-coded the, not only the shape changes, the shape changes you can see as, as, uh, in the movie, but we've, we've, we've color-coded the relative size increase of these areas. And red areas really do increase in size, and blue areas increase a little bit, and white areas increase not at all. And what you can see is that this parietal bulging is actually a displacement. It's not so much that we have uh, an expansion of the parietals during ontogeny. It, it gets displaced um, by something else, and we'll talk about the something else <coughs> later. Okay, so I, uh, I introduced to you before the research that modern humans undergo a globularization phase of the brain case directly after birth, and then as soon as the deciduous dentition is erupted, um, everyone basically grows the same. Chimpanzees, humans, uh, Neanderthals, gorillas, uh, gibbons. And, uh, uh, but very little is known about the fetal development in humans and other species, so what we wanted to know is whether our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos, undergo a prenatal globularization phase. And if this were the case, then one uh, would still be interesting, but maybe a little bit less so, because that would mean that this globularization phase is not something that's uniquely modern human, but it's just shifted from before birth to after birth. And uh, we would call this um, heterochrony, that you know, the, the same developmental mechanism um, gets shifted in, in, um, in development, but doesn't really change per se. And as a secondary aim, what we wanted to know is whether the growth rate of the brain affects brain shape. And uh, our previous research was based on, uh, on micro CT scans of skulls. Um, so we had these you know, beautiful high resolution micro CT scans of, uh, of chimpanzees and humans um, from museum collections. The problem, of course, is if you want to understand development is that these skulls necessarily are obviously dead. So, um, and as such, of course, they don't develop and they don't grow anymore and they don't tell us much about individual development. 
So what we wanted to do is overcome this limitation of working with a skeletal material and work with a living bonobos. So we started a large-scale collaboration with zoos all over Europe and, um, and the US and, uh, and tried to uh, scan pregnant bonobo mothers and tried to capture images of the fetal brain development as they were growing. And the challenge was that we did not sedate the animals. Um, they, instead, they were trained to volunteer for the examination, so they were giving treats. And, uh, and, and so we call this positive, or they call this positive re reinforcement. And it was all done um, you know, under supervision um, of, of the local keepers and, and, and done by Barbara Dreves, who is a, a trained veterinarian. And we used these ultrasound machines that you would also use for modern human babies to monitor a pregnancy. And these are the images you would get. And in the best case scenario, I would say, you get uh, beautiful images like this, where you can actually see, um, uh, the, you know, this is the face, and here is the brain and the brain case and the spine of a bonobo baby um, during pregnancy. And then we tried to combine these data with uh, the data that we already had from uh, the skeletal material, and we tried to analyze them using a very simple metric. Because you know, the beauty of the micro CT scans is that we can analyze it with really sophisticated uh, statistical methods and using hundreds of measurement points. That's unfortunately, at least uh, at this point, not possible using the ultrasound images because they're just too noisy, because everything moves, you know, the sound waves, the mother, the baby inside the mother. Um, so we get fairly noisy images, and we uh, therefore applied the same trick that the pediatricians apply when they monitor a, a human pregnancy. Um, we, uh, we calculated very simple shape indexes, indices to uh, describe the size and shape of um, the brain. So you take the bi uh, parietal diameter and the frontal uh, occipital diameter, and uh, you, you divide one by the other. And if, you know, if the brain shape is very round, then it, this index is one. And the, the smaller it is, uh, this index um, indicates that it's a, an elongated uh, brain shape. And here we can see that it's, just, it's a simple metric. This is called a cephalic index. But it captures the shape changes during the globularization phase quite nicely. So it does not capture everything, but I think it, it captures the key aspect um, of the globularization phase. And that, that's the shape changes that we see in modern humans. And this is based on clinical data from hundreds and hundreds of, of modern human babies. And you can see that um, modern humans actually um, start to become, become globular around week 27. And uh, that continues after birth. And then we asked, what do bonobos do? And they do, I wouldn't say the exact opposite, but they do something very, very different. So bonobos become more globular very early in pregnancy, but then um, they stop being um, uh, globular so they become more elongated and then eventually don't change their shape anymore um, just before birth. And what's interesting here is that we have these, um, I would say, inflection points of the curve at week 27 for humans and at week 20 for um, bonobos. And that coincides with uh, changes in growth rate. So, the, so in week 20, the bonobo growth rate slows down, whereas modern humans continue to grow at very fast rates. And in week 27, that's when the cerebellum really starts to pick up growth. Right? So there seems to be a cerebellar growth spurt, a prenatal cerebellar growth spurt, that I would say is largely responsible for this prenatal globalization in modern humans. And what you can see here is um, the, 
um, the result of fortune or, uh, or accident, if, if you want. So we, uh, we captured this, um, this bonobo baby at week 22 prenatally, so that's the fetus, and uh, I highlighted the bone. And unfortunately, this, uh, this bonobo ba baby died um, five months after birth. So the, it died from an infection and the, the zoo was um, gracious enough to uh, allow us to CT scan the, this individual. So we can now compare you know, the same individual uh, prenatally and postnatally. And if we scale um, the baby, the, well the infant, to fetal size, we can see that at least in the mid sagittal aspect, there are no changes whatsoever in cranial shape. Right? So there is no prenatal globularization phase in bonobos, at least not directly before birth. So bonobos do not change their shape. They, they increase in size, but they don't change their shape anymore. And that's, I would say, the exact opposite of what mo modern humans would do. So what we found is, um, that uh, um, modern humans do have a, a prenatal globularization phase that started at week 27. And uh, bonobos have something like a globularization phase um, prenatally, but it happens much earlier. So it's not a simple heterochronic shift. And I think um, it, uh, it might not be even uh, comparable to what's happening here. And if it is, then um, we don't have the data to support this yet but uh, it might be related to the expansion of the cerebellum in bonobos as well. And um, what's really important is that, um, yes, there seems to be a connection between the growth rate of the brain and, um, and the brain shape changes, and the brain becomes more globular during phases of rapid growth. So, um, that, I think, is, is probably uh, the most important uh, finding that, that we uh, get from this, from this longitudinal data, from the ability to study you know, the, the same individual over multiple time steps, is that it, it really seems to be um, the, the expansion rate of the brain or parts of the brain that, that drive this globalization phase. And, uh, and why is this? Is because I, I want to emphasize that what I'm trying to argue for is, is not a new type of phrenology. You know? I, I'm not trying to, to convince you that, oh, because uh, somebody has a, a round head um, versus an elongated head, that this shape of the head is, is in any way tied to cognition, not at all. So I, I'm not trying to argue that you know, having a round head makes you, uh, you know, want to go fishing or, or um, you know, try to create cave paintings. Um, quite the opposite. I don't think that there's any um, plausible connection between the actual brain shape and, uh, and cognitive uh, measures. But what's interesting is that these, um, these shape changes occur during a period of, uh, of a complete reorganization of the brain, right? So it's very telling that this happens very early prenatally and in the first years of life because we are all born with almost the same number of brain cells that we have as adults. But as, at the time of birth, they're hardly connected. So this network of the brain, that gets established um, after birth and the stimuli of the environment and, and how you interact with the environment um, that shapes these connections. And it's really interesting that um, so this is, is, is an area of active research, of course. So uh, there's a lot we don't know about uh, uh, the way the brain is connected and, and how this is guided. But what we do know is that these actions are guided by chemical cues that depend on the spatial patterning of these cues in the, in the developing brain and that not every connection in the brain is genetically predetermined. There would also be, you know, just the sheer numbers would make that impossible because we have billions of connections in our brain and only 25,000 um, genes that make our body. So it's impossible that every um, brain connection is genetically predetermined. So in a way, it's a self-organizing process. And when you grow and how you grow 
makes a difference. I'll try to illustrate this um, not by doing a sophisticated simulation, but by changing the, um, the parameters of a screensaver. So I found this screensaver online that tries to simulate fireflies. Um, so you have a, a target and you have um, uh, fireflies and maybe this also works or not, let's see. Okay, so, um, so that would be the, the standard setting of, um, of the screensaver. And I'm just trying to illustrate that a very, very subtle change in uh, the speed of brain growth can have a huge effect on the way this network is, is developing. So that would be the standard setting. And uh, we can change um, the speed of growth by changing um, slow growth. And you can see that I just changed basically the speed of the firefly and it would create a very, very different network um, structure. And here I, I, I made it speed up. And again, I'm not trying to simulate the actual you know, growth of a brain. I'm, I'm not trying to pretend it's as simple as you know, this screensaver simulating a firefly. But I'm just trying to argue that um, by changing this developmental speed in the brain, um, you, you basically change the architecture of the network. And you can make a more sophisticated, or it's actually not more sophisticated, but uh, uh, it looks more sophisticated. So I, I, um, I, I simulated the brain as being uh, perfectly spherical. And uh, I just changed the speed of, of these connections and then I analyzed um, the graph properties of this network. And you have, uh, uh, you know, with one setting, you have very localized connectivity, and uh, with just a very, very subtle change, you have a completely different graph network. You get this large-scale network by just modifying you know, simple parameters in, in, uh, in the way the brain grows. And something like this, at a much more complicated scale, uh, I think happens in the evolution of human brains as well. And uh, here you can see that uh, um, these are actual data, these are not fireflies, but here you can see the, the prenatal um, um, brain uh, wiring. This is the white matter from a diffusion tensor image um, of, a, of a fetus, of a modern human fetus. And this is the network of a three-year-old. And you can really see that you know, every fiber here represents millions of, uh, of nerves and, and connections. And you can really see that um, this happens a little bit before birth, but a large scale um, network properties are established after birth in the, uh, under the impressions of the environment. And um, basically, the, the, I would say the, the take home message is that if you um, have children and, uh, and grandchildren, then you, know, you have to be particularly careful how you uh, treat them in, in the very first year of life, because that is maybe the most important um, um, area and the most important time for the development of these uh, cognitive abilities that seem um, you know, uh, particularly important in recent modern human evolution. So I have a lot of uh, people to thank for um, that made this research possible. And of course, I want to thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them now. Or you, you can also send me an email uh, at some point later. And I can also send you papers, whatever you want. Thank you very much.